Um, I, I first got interested in computer formalization when I got interested in homotopy type theory. And this is a you know, type of mathematics that is already fairly close to formal. So the, the bridge between informal and formal there is, I think, much less. It's a nice way to get into formalization. And you know, I found it really helped me understand this new formal system. It was useful for training, for, for really understanding what homotopy type theory is all about. But um, you know, my day job, I work on infinity category theory. And I've had an instinct for a while that a lot of the literature in my field would be very difficult to formalize. And I wanted to give this talk to sort of explore the reasons for why I think that is. And to frame it um, in a way that's not that's more general than just infinity category theory, I want to use this uh, discussion of post-rigorous mathematics. So that phrase uh, comes from a famous blog post of Terry Powell that's been up for a while. I guess I didn't check the date. Um, and uh, let's see what he says about it. So uh, Terry writes, one can roughly divide mathematical education into three stages, the pre-rigorous stage in which mathematics is taught in an informal, intuitive manner based on examples, fuzzy notions of hand-waving. The emphasis is more on computation than theory. This stage generally less into the early undergraduate years. So then the rigorous stage in which one is now taught that in order to do maths properly, one needs to work and think in a much more precise and formal manner. The emphasis is now primarily on theory, and one is expected to be able to comfortably manipulate abstract mathematical objects without focusing too much on what such objects actually mean. This stage usually occupies the later undergraduate and early graduate years. I think those stages are sort of fairly familiar um, in, your, uh, in your personal development and your teaching. And then the post-rigorous stage in which one has grown comfortable with all the rigorous foundations of one's chosen field and is now ready to revisit and refine one's pre-rigorous intuition on the subject, but this time with the intuition solidly buttressed by rigorous theory. The emphasis is now on applications, intuition, and the big picture. The stage usually occupies the late graduate years and beyond. So, um, so for Terry, uh, post-rigorous mathematics is really aspirational because it allows um, one to uh, explore in a more kind of intuitive, all-seen, uh, you know, um, broad perspective. You know, this is something that he sort of advocates, uh, you know, trying to achieve, but it, it would be domain-specific. So, you know, an expert mathematician would not be able to reason post-rigorously in all sorts of fields, but only in one specific domain of expertise. Um, uh, Continuing, um, the point of rigor is not to destroy all intuition. Instead, it should be used to destroy bad intuition while clarifying and elevating good intuition. It is not only with a combination of both rigorous formalism and good intuition that one can tackle complex mathematical problems. One needs the former to correctly deal with the fine details and the latter to correctly deal with the big picture. So it's really a combination of sort of rigor and intuition. Without one or the other, you will spend a lot of time blundering around in the dark, which can be instructive, but is highly inefficient. So once you are fully comfortable with rigorous mathematical thinking, you should revisit your intuitions on the subject and use your new thinking skills to test and refine these intuitions rather than discard them. The ideal state to reach is when every heuristic argument naturally suggests its rigorous counterpart and vice versa. Then you will be able to tackle math problems by using both halves of your brain at once, at, at the same way you already tackle problems in real life. Okay. So another, I'm not just going to quote the entire blog post, but kind of close. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, I, so I think I mean I really think this is an aspiration and not an ideal that's often achieved. So um, you know, human mathematicians maybe not uh, quite Terry Tao has often failed to operate in this post-rigorous ideal state. So um, I want to use the term post-rigorous here a little bit more broadly or a little bit more loosely. So not not quite in the ideal sense that Tao frames it. We might call an argument sort of post-rigorous if it's not explained in full detail. Um, if some claims made as part of the argument may not quite be true as stated, um, and nevertheless, the proof is morally correct. Um, so this is something I feel like I encounter a lot in the literature in my field, you know, so, you know, so maybe post-rigorous adjacent. And I should say this idea of uh, some details not quite true as stated, but the proof is still true globally is something that uh, Tao also identifies with a sort of a common sort of error in uh, post-rigorous mathematics. So he writes, it is perhaps worth noting that mathematicians at all three of the above stages of mathematical development can still make formal mistakes in their mathematical writing. However, the nature of these mistakes tends to be rather different depending on which stage one is at. Um, so 
he describes this, the errors at the first two stages, but that's sort of less relevant here, and can lead to the phenomenon, which is often quite puzzling to readers at early stages of mathematic development of a mathematical argument by a post-rigorous mathematician, which locally contains a number of typos and other formal errors, but is globally quite sound with the local errors propagating for a while before being canceled out by other local errors. <laughs> <laughs> So that's that. Are we cooking? That's right. So, uh, so this is the sort of framing that I want to use for this talk. And, and again, I'm going to use uh, the term post rigorous in sort of this sense here, which is a little bit less aspirational, but I think maybe more common. So, an argument that's maybe not quite explained in full detail um, and will include some mistakes, but you know, sort of globally true in some sense of true, you know, whether it's true and it's not yet been proven, has, if it has been proven, those are some of the open questions. And um, so I wanna explore this now um, from the specific perspective of my field so we can get some concrete examples. Um, so the first part of the talk, I'm gonna give a literature survey. I'm, I'm just gonna mention um, some maybe post-rigorous mathematics in higher category theory. Uh, and then in the second part, I'm gonna do a case study where we look at a specific proof and then ask what, um, be about, uh, and, and we'll end sort of both parts with a discussion about what are the implications for formalization, because that's, of course, why we're all here. Okay, um, right, so let's do the literature survey. So I'm going to give four different examples of things that might be called post-rigorous from higher category theory. This first one is, is quite famous if you're in the field, and it refers to a, a 1991 uh, paper of Kovranov and Wojvatsky entitled Infinity groupoids and homotopy types. So what it concerns is something that's called the homotopy hypothesis, which is the, the idea that an infinity groupoid, um, so a, a weak infinite dimensional category where all the morphisms are invertible, should up to equivalence be the same as a homotopy type, which is the information provided by a, a, of a topological space that's recorded by its homotopy groups and higher homotopy groups. So, so that equivalence is called the homotopy hypothesis, and then there are also sort of truncated versions of the homotopy hypothesis where you consider only uh, you know, finite dimensional weak groupoids and uh, finite dimensional homotopy types. Okay, so anyway, here's this paper. It has uh, you know, um, some proofs, maybe not in full detail, but, you know, so that's a sense in which it's kind of post rigorous. Um, and then famously, seven years later, uh, Carlos Simpson posted a preprint um, that uh, calculates something called the three type of S2. So this is one of these homotopy types and shows that it can't be realized by a, a strict three groupoid and this contradicts the last corollary in this paper. So it was very clear at that point that there was an inconsistency in the literature between a result claimed here and a result claimed in that preprint. Um, what wasn't so clear is who was correct. And um, Wojvatsky wrote uh, in an essay that I'll show you on the next slide that uh, he was sure that they were right until fall of 2013, which you'll notice is quite later than 1998. So um, he thought that this specific calculation that appears in the Simpson paper was something that they had thought about and addressed in his paper Simpson, and, or anybody else was unable to point to an explicit mistake in the reasoning. So, you know, it's, it's of course easier to convince somebody that they're wrong by saying, you know, here's, here's the step that's wrong, or by giving a simple easy to understand proof of something that's contradictory. I mean, that's another way to reveal that you're wrong. And, and that wasn't the situation either. The, the Simpson paper was too complicated and there was no easily identifiable error. Um, uh, still, that's not entirely known what the issue is, though there are people who are closer to the field that have some sense that it has something to do with identities, which are somehow very complicated in the setting. But anyway, okay. And this, in fact, was one of the motivations for Brevatsky to get into uh, foundations and computer proof assistance and homotopy type theory. I mean, he has another famous example of a mistake in his own work that uh, was in the uh, motivic homotopy theory program, which is what he's sort of more famous for. Um, and he, he wrote an, a very interesting essay uh, on what motivated him personally to get into computer proof assistance, uh, where he diagnoses a sociological problem, a technical argument by a trusted art author, which is hard to check and looks similar to arguments known to be correct is hardly ever checked in detail. So he was sort of frustrated at the pace at which his papers were being uh, peer reviewed, I guess, um, or, the, or the rigor to which they're being peer reviewed, something like that. Okay, so, that, so that's a sort of example from the field. So another example, um, I, I don't mean to pick on Jacob Lurie, but this is, this is very uh, prototypical in the field. 
So um, to, uh, the sort of foundational text on infinity category theory is uh, Jacob Lurie's higher topos theory, and it actually was preceded by a preprint called On Infinity Topoi, you can find on the archive. And what's interesting about it is this is a book about infinity categories, which avoids, or, you know, this preprint is a 100-page you know, paper about infinity categories, which avoids using a precise definition of infinity categories. That's a kind of weird thing. Uh, and here's what he says instead. So we'll begin in section one with an informal review of the theory of infinity categories. I mean, uh, there are many approaches to the foundations of the subject, each having its own particular merits and demerits, rather than single out one of these foundations here. We shall attempt to explain the ideas involved and how to work with them. The hope is that this will render this paper readable to a wider audience, while experts will be able to fill in the details missing from our exposition and whatever framework they happen to prefer. So this is exactly, you know, Lurie aspiring to develop the theory of infinity categories post rigorously. So using sort of more intuitive discussion of intuitive sketches, heuristics for the proofs involved, and then, you know, an expert uh, in the field who can, is fluent in this sort of post rigorous theory would be able to give a formal proof. Um, the community pushed back a, a bit. I think the consensus was at the time that this was written, certainly there were not enough experts. So, uh, <laughs> So um, in fact, you know, he, he doesn't do this um, in, in the, the book that followed from this paper. He was sort of pushed into you know, being more rigorous as opposed to post-rigorous. The community was not ready for this. Um, but this sort of uh, prolocation is very common today. So you know, I'd say a high proportion of papers that are written by experts in infinity categories will have some sort of comment like this at the start. Um, um, but, but again, the, you know, this is not what ultimately happened in the, in the book. Uh, uh, Lurie you know, was sort of pressured to um, prove theorems for a concrete model of infinity categories. The, the term model here is a little bit unfortunate. It's not a model in the sense of model theory, but it's what it means is a concrete definition of an infinity category. OK, so, th so this is another sort of example of uh, sort of post-rigorous literature within the field. So, um, you know, giving proofs that really are sort of heuristic in some sense and would require a, a good deal of expertise to make rigorous. Um, here's another example. So, uh, so cohortism hypothesis is uh, a conjecture by Baez and Dolan. Uh, it classifies fully extended topological quantum field theories, which are uh, functors between higher categories, now infinity n categories as opposed to infinity one categories, and they're indexed by some uh, higher category of cohortisms between ranked n manifolds. And I'm going to quote now from a celebrated expository article on the subject by Dan Freed, who's one of the real experts. And what he writes at the beginning is interesting. He says, uh, so the cohortism hypothesis was conjectured by Baez Dolan in the 90s. It has now been proved by Hopkins Lurie in dimension two and by Lurie in higher dimensions. So this is referring to the dimension of the, the manifold. Um, so so cohortisms between sort of one and two manifolds are very well understood, but what was interesting is the higher dimensional generalization. There are many complicated foundational issues which lie behind the definitions and proofs, and the only detail, and only a detailed sketch has appeared so far. So, so the paper that he's referring to is a, a preprint of Lurie's, which claims only to be a sketch of the proof of the cohortism hypothesis. He doesn't claim to, that it's a proof of the cohortism hypothesis. The footnote then elaborates, uh, nevertheless, we use theorem and its synonyms in this man manuscript for this result, whose proof has only appeared as a sketch. Uh, the foundations are rapidly being filled in, and alternative proofs have also been carried out, though none yet has appeared in print. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, this is another, uh, right, it's, I, I'd say there's, there's uh, kind of no clear, I, I'm not quite an expert on quantum field theory, but um, my sense is that there seems to be no clear consensus on this point of view on sort of whether the cohortism hypothesis has been proven or not. I think it depends a little bit on who you ask. Um, and, you know, people are a little bit reluctant to s be public about a position on one side or the other. And so as evidence of this, there's a map overflow question from 2023. What is the status of the cohortism hypothesis? And there's sort of no answer. So. Um, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, this, this sketch is quite detailed, you know, there's a lot of substantial mathematics in this sketch proof, it's not just a, a quick sketch, and there's been a lot of elaborations of the sketch, um, anyway, okay, so that's a, and then my final example um, is a sort of two-volume study in derived algebraic geometry, so, you know, part of, uh, I think, what is 
um, I don't know, maybe a little bit unusual about infinity category um, as opposed to other you know, complicated technical subjects is it's really kind of in service of other mathematics. So, um, you know, there are you know, people working in other fields who have to use this theory. And so the sort of complexities of this theory sort of uh, multiply in a sense because somebody else is trying to do something very complicated that relies on uh, this theory whose literature, um, you know, has some interesting features. And anyway, an example of this is uh, this, you know, thousand page, uh, two volume book by uh, Gatesger and Rosenblum. Um, so much of the first volume is devoted to developing necessary preliminary results in infinity one category theory and infinity two category theory, and it includes the following disclaimer. So unfortunately, the existing literature in infinity two categories does not contain the proofs of all the statements we need. By the way, when you go from sort of one to two, things get massively more complicated. So this is a that's why that's true. Um, we decided to leave some of the statements unproved and supply the corresponding proofs elsewhere, including the proofs here would have altered the order of the exposition and would have come at the expense of clarity. Um, I don't know if the authors actually know of the proofs of the unclaimed statements, but in any case, they were very clear about what they are. So this is followed by a list of seven unproven statements. Okay, so, so these are just some examples of uh, things that have happened in the infinity category literature. Um, so, are these obstructions to formalization? You know, how, what, what, what would it look like to try and formalize results of this? So, you know, how might this literature read differently in a future where mathematicians are expected to work interactively with a computer proof assistant? You know, what, you know, what are the implications for instances such as this? So, uh, I mean, the, so the first example of this was the Kaprana Vodsky paper where there was a contradiction apparently with something. Um, so, I mean, an incorrect proof, of course, should not be formalizable and that's, that's a good thing. So, um, you know, you could imagine that if Kapranov and Vygotsky had been, you know, attempting to write their proof in a computer proof assistant, um, along the way they would have, the proof assistant might have revealed to them the error by giving attention to some sort of subtle obstacle to be overcome. So, um, you know, there's maybe some ingredient needed in an argument that's not entirely clear when you're doing pen and paper mathematics, but when the computer's like, you know, wait, why is this true? I need a justification for this. It, you know, that can really help clarify your reasoning. And I mean, in, indeed, this is sort of what Rybotsky did for the last part of his career is he moved away from pen and paper mathematics to a computer uh, to uh, have more rigor. So I think, you know, that's an instance where, you know, formalization would have clearly been helpful. Um, though, I mean, on the other hand, you know, you know, would they have been able to, well, anyway. Um, okay, so then the, the second example, this was uh, the sort of post-rigorous uh, use of infinity categories by uh, Lurie and his infinity topoi preprint and by much of the literature where, um, you know, mathematics is being developed heuristically and as opposed to using a precise definition. Um, so in this case, it really does seem to be undesirable and just in the, by the evidence of uh, the choices that are made by practitioners in the field to give a precise construction of a mathematical notion. Um, so in this case, what's needed is maybe really the totality of infinity categories. So the infinity two category of infinity categories. Um, you can imagine different approaches. Um, so one could instead axiomatize the necessary properties and then hope that the theory is not empty, you know, that there are models. Um, so, so that's a strategy. And, and in the sort of case study in part two, I'm gonna revisit this point. Maybe what I have to say about that. Um, so the third example, this is the one where uh, there's the sketch proof of the Kabordism hypothesis. Um, you know, I don't have experience trying to formalize something like that, but my guess is it's probably pretty hard to implement a, a sketch proof. I mean, you, you know, part of what's being sketched often in a sketch proof are the definitions. <laughs> you know, sometimes those aren't given precisely, and I feel like I don't, I have no idea how one would attempt to formalize a sketch of a definition. Um, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, maybe that would be an interesting project to try to, to aspire to implement these sort of formalized sketches. I mean, we, there are certainly cases where the scaffolding is very clear, where the definitions are very clear, and a proof assistant can then be used to sort of, you know, create those, what's it called when you have the, like, blueprint or something like that, yeah. you know. I mean, that's a, that's a very rigorous instance of a formalized sketch where you give the entire architecture of the proof and then just leave these open 
uh, things yet to be proven. So, um, you know, whether that would be possible for something as complicated as the cabordism hypothesis, I don't know, but that might be an interesting challenge. Um, uh, and of course, that process would make it much clearer exactly what the what gaps remain in the proof. Um, you know, there has been some analysis of that in the cabordism hypothesis sketch. You know, sort of what are the big issues. But, um, and then finally, uh, so the Gates square Rosenblum. This was the study in derived algebraic geometry, which leaves seven unclaimed uh, conjectures. This is totally formalizable. I mean, assuming that there's sufficient rigor given in the rest of the text, you just sorry a couple lemmas or, or you know, state your result as assuming x. Here's the proof of y. So that that seems totally formalizable. I mean, okay. So that was the end of the first part. Um, I don't know if we should. Maybe I should. Have a little bit of a discussion now, and then I'll go on to the the case study. Um, does anybody have anything they want to say? Yes. Um, More remarks. Second point. You say you hope that the theory is not vacuous. Uh, I think in, in, in there may be all kinds of situations where it's one of the classification problems. It might be very handy to have a theory about the vacuous. Sure. Yes. I mean, of course. But uh, yeah. I mean, on the other. Yeah. I mean, if the whole theory. I understand your point, but some kind of things can be. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So. <laughs> in some sense, that is a classic case. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, uh, yeah so it's, uh, it, uh, it, uh, there's so much good stuff in telling you how important those things are. People just saying, I missed that one. Um, but it's just yeah, so I guess I think one, one place where I see a lot of this in the past is working with computer algorithm systems, where computer algorithm systems really aren't very good at identifying vision by zero in the course of a calculation. And people with insight can sort of power through it, and I hope it will all come out in the wash. Yeah. Um, and because they just kind of know it's going to work, oh, well, it's um, um, And that's one of the things that that kind of, places where that kind of formalization that doesn't elegantly <laughs> probably be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the problems you are mentioning, uh, they are also uh, in other fields of mathematics. Sure. Like, I mean, yeah. if I do set theory, uh, is the Merrill Frankel set theory vacuous or not? Uh, it's <laughs> an interesting question. Yeah, uh, right. This was meant. This was meant to be sort of a case study that illustrates phenomena yeah, that I'm uh, hoping is more general. Yeah. Specific board of research. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. Do you, do you know if uh, Vladimir actually fixed his proof, or, did, or and the separate question is, did he fix fix it in a proof assistant? So, th so this this proof, I think, is not it's not precisely understood what the error is in the so um, yeah. So uh, Simon Henry is the person that you should ask for um, more details about that, but I, I don't quite know. Yes. Uh, thank you. That's really fascinating. I was uh, just uh, a remark about incorrect proofs. So, what are these incorrect proofs? First of all, I would say like an incorrect proof is not a proof, so it should not be called as such. Uh, and second, like you mentioned, that of course, like all these local errors are fine. So, like, okay, proof is correct. Like, it's a genuine proof, even if we have a bunch of local errors. But sometimes, like, local errors are a bit bigger, etc. There's like non-trivial work to be done to fix them, and still we want to say that. We formalize the result. So, is the incorrect proof actually here just like uh, arguments that contain invalidating mistakes, and then the statement of the theorem is wrong? Yeah. Because, but it seems that there are cases in which the statement is correct. Like Camp first attempt to prove the four-color conjecture, like there was, it was an incorrect uh, um, putative proof. Yeah. Yeah, I really, uh, thanks for that question. I mean, I, I, so I really don't think local errors are fine. I think I agree, I agree with you, an incorrect proof is not a proof. And if there's local errors, it's not a proof. It, it can be an important contribution towards an eventual proof, but I, I think it is not a proof. And one of the things I actually like Even about- local errors, you're I, I say, right, it can be an important contribution to a proof, but I would say it's, okay. it's sort of not a proof. That's my personal view. And, I, and one of the things that appeals to me about the prospect of computer formalization is it will make that, Clearer. You know, I think if you're a sort of famous mathematician, if you're Wurvatsky, if you're Terry Tao, if you're Jacob Lurie, you can give a proof with local errors and it will count as a proof. But I'm, you know, not everybody can, and, and some, or, you know, not everybody will be comfortable with that, and somebody will come later and think very carefully about the signs and get everything right. And I think that person should get credit and, you know, be recognized for that achievement. And with a computer formalization, I think this will just be a little bit <laughs> clearer, like, you know. First, of what has been achieved by giving the broad sketch, and then what uh, 
still remains to be done and then will be achieved by somebody in the future. The, the way that Gates Goy Rosenblum did it has actually had significant positive effects on the field because now people there's literature about proving the conjecture of Gates Goy Rosenblum, sort of filling in the explicit holes that they left. I think that was very nice. Uh, Jeremy, yeah. So I was thinking about this, this, this notion that some proofs are hard to formalize because the definitions are always sketched. And my understanding is that very often you know, the definitions are you know, under the usual hypotheses or there's efficiency spaces <laughs> or outside of you know, a few corner cases. <laughs> Uh, and you can handle this by just having predicates for a sufficiently nice space or you know, outside corner cases. And then as the development goes on, you know, you can say, you know, then you, you can refine that. So sufficiently nice to imply this, sufficiently nice to imply that. So even so formalization can even help with kind of imperfect or partial information, just kind of tracking, you know, what's what's being filled in as you go. Yeah, that's an interesting suggestion. Thank yeah, you. So maybe a very concrete example to in the like, make the tensor experiment. There were lots of constants, and they had to satisfy conditions, but it wasn't always really clear what the conditions were. So we had this predicate suitable, and like every time you needed things to be suitable, you just call them suitable, and then when you needed to use the hypothesis, you just added a lemma, suitable implies this. And then suitable implies end, this by sorry, and then... And then towards the end, we just gathered all of this into the definition of suitable, and all the implications were just... Projections or something, yeah. 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 Thanks for that. That's a very interesting suggestion. Yeah. So you basically frame this as a correctness question. I think what's much more at the behind this is an economics question, right? Um, certain minds you want to use to actually sketch the stay at the post rigorous um, mm -hmm. level. And I still remember when I did my uh, master's thesis at uh, Bonn, there was kind of Lots of my um, co-students went into kind of um, were assigned a chapter from one or a section from one of Gromov's paper, and every section of these papers was became one master thesis that kind of worked out all the details and uh, turned it into a somewhat more rigorous proof, hopefully. And um, so, if we think of the economics, then. I think these questions that you're raising might become slightly different. Yes, and thank you for that framing of an economics question. I'm gonna, with apologies, use that as a transition into the last uh, part of the talk, but then I'll come back, I'm sorry. Uh, so let, let's, I wanna do now a little bit more of a, a case study, so look at an actual proof, and uh, that's maybe not perfectly rigorous, and what it would mean to formalize this. Um, so I'll apologize, this is, well, Apologize on two fronts. So I, I didn't want to pick on somebody else here. So this is a proof in something that I uh, wrote. I'll give the definitions in just a second. Um, it's maybe not the best example of post-rigorous thinking in that it's, I think, a, a little less sketchy than some of the literature. But again, I didn't want to pick on anybody else. Um, also, I couldn't think of a way to make this understandable to somebody who doesn't know any ordinary category theory. So if that's not you, I apologize. Um, uh, OK, so I'm going to quickly give some, but let me, I'll try and describe it broadly, and maybe some of the points will come through. And then there's a discussion at the end, similar to the one we just had. So, um, so here's some definitions you need to know. So an infinity category A um, is what's called pointed if it has an object that is both initial and terminal. And sort of post-rigorously, what that means is there exists unique morphisms to and from any other object. Uh, rigorously, it means something a bit more than that. Um, and we'll say that a pointed infinity category is stable if every morphism in it has both a fiber and a cofiber. So what those refer to are pullbacks and pushouts of the morphism, and then including either the morphism from this uh, pointing, which using the fact that it's initial, or to the pointing using the fact that it's terminal. Um, and moreover, that these fiber and cofiber squares coincide. So there's the, the data that the, a square on the left either is a sort of pullback or a pushout, and it's sort of saying that these uh, conditions agree. OK, so here's then a proposition. So this is from uh, a book, uh, Elements of Infinity Category Theory, that's co-written with Dominic Verity. Uh, it says that a stable infinity category, so I, I copied the definition in case you want to look at it again admits all pushouts and pullbacks, not just the ones of the particular sort of span and co-span that we've displayed there. And moreover, a square is a pushout if and only if it is a pullback. So the definition um, says that certain pushout and certain pullback squares coincide, but the, the statement is, again, all pullback and pushout squares exist, and they always coincide. So here's the proof that we wrote in the book. Um, so this is a, this, I mean, this is a screenshot. Uh, 
So it says, given a generic family of co-spans, so that's this uh, F and G here, uh, sort of form the co-fiber of F followed by the fiber of the composite map. So the, the co-fiber is sort of building this square. Uh, here's the composite map that's being referred to, and then the fiber is building that square. Um, so by the definition of a stable infinity category, this co-fiber sequence is also a fiber sequence. By the pullback cancellation results, so this is sort of pullback composition and cancellation, we conclude that this thing, which was defined as the, the fiber of the, or the pullback of this rectangle, is also the pullback of the right-hand square. So that is the proof as given. So again, we, we sort of start with this data. We form this push-out square. By stability, it's also a pullback square. We can then form the pullback of the larger rectangle, and then by pullback cancellation, that right-hand square is a pullback square. That's the construction of pullbacks. And then there's a second paragraph that discusses the second part of the statement, but let's just, I'm trying to not be too technical, so let's just stop here. So um, that's, that again is the proof that appears in the paper, but then we attempt to make that a little bit more rigorous to explain in a little bit more detail. So then the next page continues with a digression on the use of generalized elements to define functors. So, um, you know, so here we're, what we've done in this proof is we've given a construction sort of in infinity categories object-wise, and that's always a little bit delicate because, um, you know, that's sort of like giving it a, a mapping from the points of an infinity category to the points of another infinity category, and to make it a functor between infinity categories, then you need to extend to the one cells and the two cells and the three cells and the four cells and all the way up and then check that everything is suitably coherent, so there's a, sort of a lot left out there. And um, what we explain is the first paragraph of the proof just given uh, takes a generic family of cospans and constructs a rectangular diagram. So there's something a little bit funny in the in sort of the language in the diagram. What the diagram looks like is I just have a single arrow and another arrow. But what we're actually referring to is sort of a family of arrows indexed by an arbitrary object x, or you know, maybe a family of arrows in context x, whereas um, just having a pair of arrows would be the case where x is the terminal infinity category, where I'm really just picking this point. Um, and they're saying that uh, you know, pullback composition and cancellation can be applied at that level for sort of families of elements and not just elements themselves. By the innate lemma, a construction given as a mapping on generalized elements defines an arrow internally to the infinity cosmos, let's ignore what that is, in this case taking the form of a functor like this. So my, my goal um, really was to define a functor from the infinity category of cospans in A to uh, the infinity category of diagrams of the shape here. And we then elaborate what goes into the definition of the functor. So this is a this is, so, so this is essentially an elaboration of what happened in that one paragraph kind of post-rigorous proof. So it revisits sort of every step and says, you know, this is how in that step we can actually understand our construction as giving a construction at the level of the full infinity category and not just the elements of the infinity category. So obviously I'm not going to read that because nobody has time for this. Okay, so the, the point of that case study was... Uh, Again, to ask this question about, you know, what are the prospects for formalization of something like this? Um, you know, and a, and a proof that's more like this is, this is kind of the common thing that will appear in the infinity categories literature. The, you know, the fact that it's uh, sort of elaborated in this manner is kind of less common in the literature. Um, so I can imagine it's kind of three strategies for formalizing the uh, above proof and the kind of background mathematics on which it depends. So, so really my aim here is to, to not just sort of formalize this module of conjectures, but to actually formalize it. Um, so I mean, strategy one is to just give precise definitions of initial and terminal object and fiber and cofiber in a specific model of infinity categories. So if we're, we're really going to formalize it in, in lean, uh, you know, in lean MATLAB or some other library, developing set theory, um, you know, I'd have to take the sort of informal versions of uh, initial and terminal object and pullback and push out and fiber and cofiber and all of that and give fully formal definitions. These certainly exist in the literature and this could be done. Um, so then we'd have to prove this pullback composition and cancellation lemma. That was the key ingredient that went into the proof. Um, and then, uh, you know, there was something here about the families of elements. Um, that could actually be addressed in a, in a different way than I uh, did in the sketch of the proof, um, you know, using some 
particular feature of infinity categories as opposed to internal infinity categories that universal properties are pointwise defined. Um, this would kind of avoid the need for generalized elements. But that's, that's one prospect. Um, uh, you know, the people who have been involved in sort of quasi-categories in MATLAB can get a sense of sort of how much work might be involved in that, but you know, that, that certainly is a prospect. Okay, so another strategy would be to try and do this a little bit more axiomatically, but still in set theory. So this is a, something else that you could imagine implementing in MATLAB. Um, so here, um, the, the book that I was just quoting from is uh, written based on an axiomatization of the infinity two category of infinity categories. So this is an idea that I kind of mentioned when we were discussing the sort of post-rigorous definition of an infinity category. Um, so what we do in this book is we define something that's called an infinity cosmos, and that is a definition that's written in set theory that you could uh, formalize. Um, and then what we define an infinity category to be is an object in an infinity cosmos. So we have some sort of abstract notion of infinity category. It's an object in this sort of big universe where infinity categories live, and we give a precise definition of the universe. Um, what would be difficult, and, and then um, the point is these axioms are sufficient to define everything above. So the, you know, the, where this appeared in the book was sort of chapter four. The previous chapters explain you know, how would you define the pullback and the pushout and the fiber and the cofiber and initial and terminal for an infinity category conceived of as an object in an infinity cosmos. So again, I think that is totally rigorous in set theory and could be formalizable. Um, what would be less economical or where, or where the economics would go is in proving that there are any examples of infinity cosmos. So if we do want a non-vacuous theory, so, so this would be hard, but the payoff would be once you show that quasi-categories give an example of an infinity cosmos, then you have all the theorems done already because that would be easier. Um, this would also be a way to achieve the theorems in multiple models simultaneously because quasi-categories are not the only example of an infinity cosmos, complete Siegel spaces and other things are too. So that's another prospect. And then the final strategy is to kind of avoid set theory as, at all. So avoid the technicalities of set-based models by developing the theory of infinity categories uh, synthetically in some sort of domain specific type theory. Um, so the, this idea of generalized elements, which was sort of a key framing of the proof are just terms in context. And so the, the sort of proof that I sketched where you just pretend you have an arrow and you have another arrow and you do some element wise construction, that's basically a rigorous proof in this synthetic formal system. So what's nice then is the informal and the formal are much closer. Uh, the complexity would go in then interpreting that entire formal system in lean. That would in fact again be very difficult, but maybe Maybe we don't feel the need to compile everything out to set theory, or maybe you trust that the experts have done this. Um, so and another complexity here, I guess, is that this, this is not formalizable in Lean because it's based on an alternate foundation system. You would need some sort of bespoke proof assistant, such as this thing called RPK. Um, and that's where I wanted to end. I should say that there are uh, uh, some formalizations that are related to those three strategies that I've mentioned here. So uh, thanks very much.